you will turn with your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And I'm going to be reading today from verse 5 through verse 11 of Romans chapter 8. There are some people who consider this to be the greatest chapter in the Bible, but I don't know how you would tell what the greatest chapter in the Bible is. But I would say this, it is a very moving chapter, and it tells us about the Spirit of God. What is He doing in our lives? It is all based on what Paul said in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Here it's telling us how the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. And today, what you're going to read about is a basic distinction between those who have the Holy Spirit and those who do not. Let's pay attention to what God says to us this morning. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the minds on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He raised Jesus Christ from the dead, who also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that he is the one who changes our hearts and our minds so that we love you. So now, our Holy Savior, enlighten our minds so that we know how this word speaks to us this morning. Amen. It is extremely difficult today in our current environment to think in exclusive terms. We don't like that. We don't want to make any type of distinctions whatsoever. And you hear it like this. There are two sides to this story. Now, once when I was in another church, there was a divorce issue that came up. And I remember listening to people, and they were saying, well, there are two sides to this story. And I was also thinking to myself, maybe there's not. Maybe there isn't always two sides to every story. Maybe there is one side that is true and one side that is false. And when it comes to the Bible, let's be honest here. Jesus makes some distinctions himself. You either follow me or you don't. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. That's a distinction. He's saying some people are going to follow me, some people are not. In John's Gospel, you have the light of the Gospel versus darkness. And God says, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. If you read the Bible, you can't get over the fact that there are some distinctions that God makes. And even though our world doesn't like those distinctions of saying there's insiders and outsiders, we do it all the time. In fact, those who would say that Christianity is wrong for making such distinctions would start a new holy war over political issues, global warming, for instance, where there are definitely those who believe it and if you don't, they're considered a climate denier. There are other issues as well, such as when you do your math problems, as far as I remember, 2 plus 2 is 3 equals 4. And if you say 5 on your exam paper, it's still wrong, so there's a distinction there. But I want to get back to the Bible, and I want to talk about a basic distinction that is in the world today. 
Those who are in the flesh versus those who are in the spirit. And what the Apostle Paul is doing here is showing that, first of all, not everybody is saved by faith. There are those who are outside of the covenant of grace. But those who are inside of the covenant of grace are there because of the spirit of the living God who is at work in their lives. Those who are outside of the spirit of God are still in the flesh. Now this is a good news chapter here. What's that got to do with you? It's this. You're going to see that the spirit of God has changed your life. And that is what you should be thankful and joyful for. But before we get to the blessings you have of the Holy Spirit, I want you to see the other side of the picture, which is the flesh. And over and over again, in this passage, depending on the, the Bible version you are reading, it says, the fleshly mind. It may say the sinful nature. It may say something else. But the literal rendering throughout these verses is flesh. And when we think of flesh, don't think of, well, just this. It is basically this is what Paul is talking about when he talks about the flesh. It is a whole lifestyle that is outside of the will of God. And here's what he's not talking about. And this is quite popular back in the 70s and 80s. We'll see it in verse 6, if you have the King James Bible. It talks about the carnally minded person. Now, it's still that word flesh. In other Bible versions, it will say sinful nature, or the mind of the sinful man, or in the ESV, those who have set their minds on the flesh. Now, the carnal Christian idea was this. That you've got two classes of Christians. You've got super Christians who have the Holy Spirit, but then you've got these carnal Christians who don't have the full measure of the Spirit. They have made, for example, some sort of confession of faith, but they are not really up there with the rest of us. Now, I've got to tell you, that is not what Paul is saying here. Paul is not saying there is a two-tier Christianity. He's not saying that at all. In chapter 7, Paul says he's struggling with sin. Struggling with sin mightily. But look at verse 9 here. I want you to notice what it says. This repeats the whole idea that there's a two-level of Christianity. You, however, are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong in him. What Paul is saying is this. If you are calling out on Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have the Spirit of God. Period. Now, I will be the first to admit that people who are Christians do struggle with sin. I mean, i got to tell you, I've got more people in church. They can just be stinkers. You know? Some of them, you just don't want to get too near. All right? In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul sort of says, well, that there are these people who are Christians, but they're really living more like unbelievers. And is that true? Yes, because Christians can still be immature. They can still sin, such as David and Paul did, or Peter did. And yeah, we can see Paul. But there's not a two-tier Christianity. As scripture says, flesh gives birth to flesh. The spirit gives birth to the spirit. And the Christian who truly believes has the spirit of the living God dwelling in them. They could not confess the name of Christ without the spirit working in them. There is no second string Christianity. There are people in the church, though, who claim to be Christians, but they may not really be Christians. We've got to keep that in mind as well. There are people who come to church for the wrong reasons. 
Now today, we lament the fact that not as many people go to church. But let me tell you, back in the 50s, it was a lot easier to go to church. A lot of people went to church for the wrong reasons. It's just what, quote, good people did. It may have had nothing to do with the Spirit of God. They went to church because daddy or granddaddy went to church, not because the Spirit of God was working in their lives. They went to church because that's what good businessmen did in this community. But let me tell you what Paul is talking about here for those who are in the flesh. He's not saying they're second-stage Christians. He's saying they're unbelievers. That's what a person is who is in the flesh. And look at the mindset of that fleshly unbeliever. Look at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. See that? They have a certain mindset. Look at verse 6. To set the mind on the flesh is death. Verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. What Paul is telling us here by using that term, the mindset of the flesh, is that there are people in this world who care very little for the things of God nor the life of the soul. They are not concerned with the spiritual. They do not care one bit about what God is doing in this world. And that's the mindset. They don't care. In fact, you may have people who come to church, they're not Christians, because they care very little about what the gospel says, nor do they care about what God's word says, nor the life of the Spirit. And, and not only that, look at verse 7. There's certain behavior here. It says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is Hostile to God. Hostile. In Romans 5.10, listen to what it says again about some people. It says, for if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. What does that mean before you were Christian? You were enemies. You didn't like God. You can go to the book of James, and here's what it says. In the book of James about the worldliness and the flesh of this world. Notice what it says in James 4.4. 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be friends of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you're in the flesh, you are hostile to God. You are enmity with God. You hate God. And let me show you how this happens. At Christmas time, we go knocking on doors, and we hand out Christian literature or cookies or something along those lines. You can knock on the doors, and here's what's going to happen. And this happened to me. The door gets slammed in my face. Why? Because they hate God. They don't want to have anything to do with the God of the Bible. And that's one way that people react. But let me tell you, there's another way that is not so well, well known. They just don't care. They just don't care. They don't have to show anger. They don't have to show open dislike. Here's what they do. That's nice. That's interesting. And I, I had a, a sermon one time that I read, and I gave it to somebody, and I thought, man, they're going to be. This may help them because I knew they were struggling. That's nice. I thought it was great. Other people thought it was great. Man. But it's still hostility. They just don't like God. And notice the behavior here. The mindset is hatred, dislike. Notice the behavior in verse 7. Because it goes on to say, For the mind that is set up flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Fleshly, those who are unbelievers, they don't care about God's law. They don't want to believe in God's law. They are egocentric. It's all about them. It is not about the church. It is not about Jesus Christ. It's all about them. And their pleasure, what they want to do, even if it's sinful, they can't obey the Lord and when I was at Fort State University, I spent a good deal of my time in the graduate program in religion. And there 
They were not willing to submit to the laws of God nor his commandments because they just didn't care. They would have had to give up their academic reputation to follow God, and they were not going to do that. I remember one time I was student teaching. Well, not student teaching, I was an adjunct professor at the University of North Alabama, teaching religion. And I had one student from Canada, and let me tell you, he was spicy. He did not believe in Christianity. I said, well, have you ever read the Gospel of John? No. Well, why don't you read the Gospel of John and then see what you think? And he comes back in a few days. Well, I read it. And you're right. It's, it's, it's not what I thought. But I don't bow the knee to anyone. There you have the mindset of unbelief. We're going to submit to God. I don't care what God says. I just don't care. I'm doing it the way I want to do it. I'm living my life. That's the mindset of the flesh. Listen to what Galatians 5.19 says when it talks about the difference between the flesh and the spirit. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Some of these you'll recognize. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Sensuality. Idolatry. Sorcery. Then listen to these. Enmity. Strife. Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Sexual immorality, oh yeah, that's a sin. What about fits of anger? What about envy? What about selfishness? Mind the flesh, which does not want to submit to God. Let me tell you what this has to do with. I often ask myself this question. Why is the world like it is? In fact, I asked my wife that question this morning as I was thinking about all the lies that I have had to deal with in my life in the public sector and all of the cheating that I have had to deal with. And then it hit me. Why is there so much vindictiveness? Why is there so much dishonesty? from the highest offices in the land all the way to times in the church. Tell you what, the flesh. The world's not Christian. We shouldn't expect it to act the way that we think it should. The problem is we're too naive. And one of the best things you can tell your kids is the flesh dominates out there. And it will disappoint you. And it will take advantage. There's something else here that we've got to understand. Listen to that list in Galatians. There can be some nice middle class, upper middle class people. They go to PTA meetings. They vote Republican. They served in the armed forces. But they have no interest in God. Yes, they can be nice. They can go to the Kiwanis Club. They can be respectable. But they are still far from God. They can even be interested in the liturgy of the church. They can be fascinated by the theology of Presbyterian. And it can be exciting for them to study, but they're still in the flesh. They are not saved. So that's who the people are at times. No interest in the God of God. No interest in growing close to Him. No interest at all in eternal life. Some are, and most are outside the church, but some. They can creep their way into the church and they're like the Corinthians, making a mess of things. <coughs> but what Paul says, that's <coughs> not how a Christian behaves or acts. Because there's not only the flesh in the spirit, and here's where the good news comes. First of all, if you are in the spirit, you are 
focusing in on God, just as verse 6 says. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Life. The life of God, the life of man, of Christianity, the life of the soul. There is a desire to know the God of the Bible. There is a desire to know his ways. There is a desire to know his revelation. Let me give you an example. You got two different people. You've got some kids, maybe a teenage boy, and at night he is reading his old beat up Bible. He's got one of those near varsity study guides. He's trying to figure out what the Bible says. On the other hand, you have perhaps a church officer who likes to go to meetings. He'll get into the budgets and everything else. But he has very little interest in the life of God. Which one is closer to God? Or let's say you've got an elderly lady who reads her living Bible every morning and every evening. She works with evangelism for children. And yet you have this other lady who is the head of the mix. She's interested in table decorations and the meetings they have, but cares very little for God. Doesn't read the Bible, doesn't care about missions, has no desire to pray. Who's closer to God? Which one is under the flesh? Which one is under the spirit? You tell me. Listen to what the hymns say. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love. Do you love what God loves? That's the good news. You're a Christian. You've got the Spirit of God. You confess Jesus Christ. And notice what else it says here. There is a focus on peace. They've set their minds on life and peace. The peace is the peace with God. They are off the treadmill. They have to prove themselves to God. They are resting in God. And peace is also a fruit of the Spirit in which they are seeking to live peacefully with other believers in the household of faith. Tell me, you like peace? Peace based on the gospel? You've got the Holy Spirit work. Do you have peace with God? Do you realize that you're saved by grace? And you are saved because of what Christ does? You've got peace. That's a blessing. And then finally, notice what else he says in verse 11. If the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies to the Spirit who dwells in you. In other words, brothers and sisters in Christ, that same Holy Spirit who gave you new life is one day going to be there when you die. And when Jesus comes back, and body and soul will be reunited, the focus is on the future, not on the past. The focus is going to be on what God is going to do with you and your body. It is the future in which there will be no more pain. A future when all the frustrations of this world will be done. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And if any of you in this room desire that, the Spirit's at work, not the flesh. So ask yourself this question. Are you dominated by the flesh or the Spirit? Ask yourself, do you desire God? Do you desire His ways? Do you desire to live as a follower of Christ? Do you desire the new heavens and the new earth where everything will be made perfect or is your focus only on this life? The good news is if you follow in those categories, you have the spirit of the living God. You are blessed by God. In the Presbyterian world, and in the evangelical world, there's not a lot of talk about the Spirit. People who talk about the Spirit all the time are Pentecostals, Charismatics. But here, Paul talks about the Spirit. It is a Spirit who has changed you. It is a Spirit who has given you a taste of God. A taste of a new life. A taste for the future coming of His kingdom and His fullness. So do you desire God? Do you desire this peace? Do you desire that new life? The good news is, you've got the Spirit. 
Let us pray. O Lord and God, our Heavenly Father, please be with us now. And help us to see the blessing that we have as people who are in the Spirit. O Lord God, lift us up now as we sing praises to you. And Spirit of God, descend now upon our hearts anew. Amen. Our final